And that's the key property we're taking advantage there. It's, it's atomic. The entire thing occurs, or it's as if it doesn't, it, it never started. Why is that important? It's important in the context of what? That atomicity of transmission, or atomicity of, of associated with a block of code, or, or atomicity associated with an ordering that goes on on Amazon. Why, why is that important? Okay, yeah, it's a big issue with corruption. And ladies and gentlemen, um, from whence does that, whoa, um, from whence does that corruption come? Okay, good. And what can cause a transaction to be unfinished? It crashes halfway through. Battery dies. Errors occur. Errors occur, ladies and gentlemen. Errors happen. I hate to tell you this as software engineers, but it's an ugly world out there. And errors happen. And often we as software developers write code in a sympathetic way because we want to focus on the main case, the case where we get things done. We write code as if errors don't happen. I mean, the truth is there's a lot of temptations to do that. You focus on the main case where it's able to do its job. That's the more intellectually engaging thing often. It's what the user wants, and so you focus on that. And the risk is, particularly with distributed systems, systems which exhibit concurrency, if you're not paying attention to the error conditions, bad things can happen. Even in sequential systems, if there's, a, if there's an error halfway through something and you throw an exception, you don't want to be in a situation where you charge the person for the book and then find, oh, there's no book to ship because someone else just you know, uh, there, there was a problem with, with in fact, uh, completing that final part of the transaction. But it's most critical with concurrency because someone could grab that book just as you're about to assign it to, uh, uh, to the person. So you want things that, that by completing, by only getting partway through, they don't leave it in an inconsistent state. By an inconsistent state, I mean it's you've charged the person, but you haven't committed to sending them the book, or you sent them the book and you haven't charged them, or the photo has been placed on the server, but it isn't incorporated in time, and it's deleted from the phone. Now the photo is if it's disappeared. It's neither on the phone nor the server. Nor, there, nor do you want an error to occur such that the phone is on the server and the phone. The photo is on the server and the phone, where it's up, uploaded to the server. The server says, yeah, I got it, but just before it's deleted on the phone, the phone battery dies, and it's sitting on the phone as well. That's an inconsistent state. Then you get it as its, its photo is transmitted twice, which is artifactual. In general, when we have these systems with a concurrency, um, we need to worry about about two things happening at the same time. While you're undertaking this block of logical steps, you know something else happens halfway through. Maybe a resource that was available up here is no longer available down here because someone else got it. Someone else took control of it. And, and it could be taken out from under you, and you need a way to kind of roll this whole thing back. You may be all the way almost to the end. You can't finish the job, and you've got to roll it back. Got to clean up the work and make it as if it never happened. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I expect of students when it comes to, you know, these sort of operations um, involving distributed databases and and um, smartphones, for example. These apps that involve uploading things. I do expect to see attention to the issue of atomicity of a transaction. And there's many ways this can be accomplished in two-phase commit. What William was referring to earlier, I think, um, where you get both parties to say, are you a good state? Yeah, I'm in a good state. Are you a good state? Yeah, I'm in a good state. Okay, we're both okay? Okay, it's done. The transaction is finished, um, and uh, we, can, we can go on. But if anything happens, it's rolled back. It's as if it didn't happen at all. Does that make sense? 
And that's what I'd like to see as far as transmission. I mean, frankly, it's kind of common sense from a user standpoint. If from a user standpoint, they don't care about two-phase commit or whatever is needed to deal with this, uh, to, to deliver on it. They just want, they don't, just don't want to see the same photo twice, or worse, they don't want to see their phone, the data they recorded on the phone disappear, you know, disappear mysteriously just because the server had some problem with its disk, something along those lines. You want to get the job done completely or not at all. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so um, good stuff. Um, so let's, let's talk today about uh, requirements. I'm going to be hitting um, a few essential issues with this issue of recording requirements today. This is particularly important for this class historically because there's real stakeholders involved. And those stakeholders often have very different mental models um, of the world and of what they're seeking than you folks do. And it's really, really easy on the requirements front for you to think you know what they want, for them to think that you know what they want, and you have totally different ideas of what's actually wanted. And it doesn't pop up till much later after a lot of work has been done and needs to be rolled back, needs to be undone and redone to deal with the real requirements. It's particularly, particularly important because also you're helping, you're helping the user discover what they want to do. And sometimes there's a lot of tacit assumptions on their part that they don't know to bring forward. They don't know to state. So we're going to talk about some best practices in the requirements area um, so that we can avoid some of the classic problems in this area. So what is a requirement? It's a criteria that must be satisfied by successful project completion. So with some of those, um, the folks who gave talks, you may have uh, heard me ask the question, and this is a common question others here have heard me ask. Um, you know, what would it mean for this project to be successful? Describe, describe what success would mean. What set of sort of criteria would be met? This is one of the criteria. It's a condition for successful uh, project completion. Okay? And often this is some very specific thing that has an impact on the user, some problem that's been solved. In this process we call requirements gathering or requirements elicitation is an attempt to discover what project, product is desired by people. Now, it sounds very basic and very straightforward. And you notice certain things are, are highlighted here. It's an attempt. It's not always successful. It takes actually quite a bit of work sometimes, often. Trying to discover this thing. It's not obvious, typically, what product. This has to do with the deliverable is desired. What are they seeking? by people. Which people? Sometimes there's multiple stakeholders. There's the people who are purchasing it and there's the end users. Or there's different groups within the people purchasing it. So why this lecture? Because requirements gathering is oddly, is curiously, is, is unexpectedly important and hard. So I want to motivate that a little bit. But I also want to provide tips for eliciting requirements more reliably. So there's some basic tips for doing this in a way that won't be perfect, but it will lower your vulnerability to some obvious misunderstandings. And uh, these are, these include sort of procedures and possibility for requirements to bear in mind when you're talking with stakeholders. Sort of things that you can ask proactively, you know, um, about the performance side that you might otherwise have, have overlooked. Um, and that will lessen ambiguity. Okay. Um, and you know this is about trying to make sure your system isn't missed, missed out entirely in some important requirements and helping to lessen the risk of requirements changes. OK, so why talk about this? Well, you may recall from an earlier summary of problems with projects that problems with requirements are the number one or number two reason for failed projects, for runaway projects, projects that take a lot longer than expected to complete, a lot more, a lot higher cost than expected to complete, or that are just outright canceled. 
Why would that be? Why is it that that requirements might might cause such problems? Can anyone give a few ideas? The yeah. Technical people would have a different idea of the okay. The okay. And what's the implication of that in terms of how does that link into being a runaway project, for example? Okay, good. Yeah, so they say, well, that's not what I wanted. I, you know, that, that's not what I wanted. I didn't tell you to do that. And, that's, and, the, soft, and the you know, folks on the software development side, well, I thought that's what you were asking for. And they said, no, no, nobody does it that way. Oh, come on. Um, you know, don't you know about basic biology? Um, you can't have a system that you know, maintains that. You know, that's impossible. You know, go back to the drawing board. Uh, rethink that. Um, so software people often have a different notion. That leads them to undertake a lot of work. And when a requirement is mistaken in that way, what gets built as a result? OK, what's the wrong, what, what are these things that get built? If we have a requirement that's off, what does it affect? Give me some things that it affects. So we have a, some requirement, or some understood requirement. OK, what, what are some things that it it affects what gets what needs to be redone if it changes or if the understanding of it changes okay so refactoring of code I hear code what else what else besides code yeah the whole design of the system is often throw what data structures you have what abstractions you're maintaining how they interact with each other, what methods they offer. OK, what else? OK, uh, yeah, yeah, so budget. That's kind of a, a, a derived thing from these things. Because if you've got to pay people to recode all these things, you're going to be charging more money. But what things go along with code in a, in a, in a healthy test environment? Tests. tests, OK. So there's a lot of tests that typically will have to be Redone. What else will go along? What else do you deliver to the user besides running code? Documentation and, and help systems, those sort of things, right? Um, so, so help systems, right? These things are all dependent on the requirement. So your requirements change. You've got this ripple through effect across all of this that it ends up changing a bunch of different factors. You end up having to redo whole pieces of the system. And of course, if you have traceability and you could trace what things depend logically on that requirement, you have a better sense of what needs to be changed. But often, it's quite a lot. And as a result, fixing things in the requirement space is often far, far cheaper than fixing it later. This is from a study, I think it was done by IBM, um, where they found sort of the, the phase in which a problem was found and how much it costs to to fix relative to fixing it in the requirements phase. It can be. It can be possible. <laughs> okay. So change is another issue because change may come about because of a misunderstanding. But why else could change come about? So great question. Why else could change the requirement come about? Yeah. Good. That's right. How about another reason? New technologies. New technologies come out. Great. So, you know, KitKat is out, or Lollipop is out, or whatever it is, the new version, newest version. Okay. What else? Changing market. Yeah, changing market structure. And particularly, um, competitors um, have moved into this area. Um, you want to you wanna get a, a leg up there. You don't want to be you know, have, have yourself look uh, like a less competitive uh, alternative, so you ask for more requirements. Um, and also, in terms of the business environment, sometimes mergers take place. Um, you know a guy who, had a, who has a high position uh, in a major bank in Singapore, and um, when that bank merged with another bank, guess what? A lot of their IT systems had to be redone to work with the new bank's functionality. So requirements change. You know, uh, a new fiscal year is upon us. We have a whole new division of our company. We need, we need some additional functionality. 
So, you know, requirements can change for many reasons. You can get a good set early on that's less vulnerable. We're not dealing with perfection here, typically, but we're dealing with risk. We're dealing with trying to minimize our risk profile with respect to misunderstandings and with respect to omissions and how people think about it. And we can get it basically really in a, in a solid situation early on. And I have some example requirements documents, if you're interested in looking at, that really pin things down. And the issue is not that they're perfect, um, that they'll communicate perfectly to anyone, no matter how good their knowledge of English or what have you. But they really, by orders of magnitude, lessen the risk that there'll be a misunderstanding between the developers and the, the folks who want the system. And that's really the purpose of requirements. It's, it's another aspect you could think of it of, of risk management, try to lessen this obvious risk. Because it's a number one or number two risk for a lot of projects. So why is it that later phases of a software project require more work to fix a problem? Yeah, more backtracking. A lot more stuff that has to be thrown away, right? A lot more stuff that has to be, I mean, after all, if you're in the coding phase, often you've got to, and you discover a problem at that phase that's, um, that's uh, a requirements problem. Now you have to throw away code, very likely, tests associated with that code. After all, if this method is going away, there's no unit test to test it now. You might have to change the design associated with that and elements of documentation. If you catch it in the design phase, when you're sort of designing the high level data structures and how they'll work together, what classes they'll be, and how they'll depend on each other, even to the point of what calls what, you're going to have a lot less work because the code hasn't been written yet. The tests, the tests are not yet typically fully, uh, not yet written, or they've just started to, towards, um, towards some basic uh, coding up of, of early tests. So the earlier you can find it, the better. And it goes up exponentially, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it goes up or geometrically, if we consider these discrete phases. It rises geometrically. Why do you think a 1,000 times in operation? How could that possibly be? Give me a type of system where it would be incredibly painful to change it when it's actually in operation by users. Anyone know international road dynamics in town? Software shop, they do hardware as well, uh, up in, um, off of Millar Ave. 43rd Street, maybe. Um, I visit there for my internship, uh, internship uh, supervision, et cetera. Um, anyone know what they do? Yeah, exactly. So they put sensors into roads. Some of their biggest markets are overseas, places like Malaysia, Singapore, et cetera. Great. So they, they put these things um, right next to the road. And these are embedded systems. They're systems which in order to be updated, at least last time I talked with them, you would have to go physically to that system and update it. And there'd be many such systems along roads. So now you're talking about an awful lot of work to roll out a fix. Or you know, you have an app on a phone, and suppose there's no auto-update functionality uh, associated with it. Now users are encountering problems, and you have to ask ask for them to download the app again, or ask someone to go out and, and give them a new copy of this app for the sales force, or what have you. So, so once things are in operation, often they're a lot trickier to replace, a lot more expensive to replace. Um, so it turns out that requirements have this pervasive effect uh, throughout this structure here. What do we call this structure here? Iron the iron triangle. Quality or scope, cost, time. And this is tension between them. These are shown, these causal linkages are shown with a, with a conceptually a negative sign. This is, indicates you have this go up, it puts pressure on that to go down given certain um, given certain constraints, limited resources. 
So requirements quality affects a lot of things. It affects early fault elimination, which affect the speed with which you can deliver it, the, the time frame of the project, and the economy. You, you find these things early. There's a lot less work debugging them, et cetera. A lot less code thrown away. It affects development effectiveness, the, the degree to which developers can work kind of on a, on a constant level rather than constantly asking questions of the client, which again affect those two. But it also affects um, you know, eliminating redundant development, development that gets thrown away, again affects those two. And um, the uh, effectiveness in terms of really targeting what the user wants and, and, and meeting their needs, which affects the perceived quality of the system. So here, requirements is something that affects all components of the Iron Triangle together. There's, there's components of all of this. For anyone who's been in 371 or its grad version, this corresponds to a what? 371? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. This corresponds to a 371 slide. Yeah. Uh, no, the 394. Sorry. What, what does this correspond to, this construct? This is, this is uh, uh, Jerry Weinberg's version of a causal loop diagram. It's a causal loop diagram. His book is, is full of this for software. Um, his volumes, four volumes. OK, so good requirements have, um, have ramifications across the process. Elimination of needless development, reduction in project risk, that a stakeholder will be disappointed, clearer expectations, faster development, um, uh, simpler formulation of testing strategy, um, all sorts of good stuff. OK, so what are some problems with requirements? After all, what could go wrong with a requirement? So you want to write down what the client wants. What could go wrong? Give me a few things. What, what could go wrong with those things you write down? There was an XPD comment about, comment about it. OK. And it was like, uh, can you take all this information and store it to the company? And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that in five seconds. And it was like, oh, and can you find out if, it, if they're looking at it as storage or not? And it's like, yeah, if you give me PHP funding in 10 years. Like, <laughs> yeah. So sometimes the client doesn't know what's possible. Right. Yeah, precisely, precisely. So um, we had a client recently uh, contact us about a system, and, and they wanted to know, OK, could they use our app to record audio? This is the, you know, the, the survey app. It runs on smartphones together with recording sensor data. I said, yeah, recording audio, that would, that would be a minor task. And they said, OK, um, so that's great. So people could answer these surveys in audio? I said, yeah, um, uh, to a degree. They said, OK, so suppose we want to be able to recognize if you said, um, in response to this question, you said, you know, um, uh, you know, what do you think of, you know, this healthcare, this healthcare policy? And they said, it's shitty. Do you want, you know, they want to be able to recognize that the person doesn't like it and then do something else and in real time using voice recognition. And I said, well, you know, that's, um, that, that's a more complex thing, for, for sure. So it's, you know, from a user's perspective, it's not obvious what's possible, what's not. OK, so that's one thing. It's, it's, um, there, may be, there may be tacit assumptions for a very broad statement, like I want your system to take surveys and audio. If you really unpack it, there may be unrealistic assumptions bound up into that ambiguous statement. I want it to be able to answer a survey in audio. It sounds to the software developer like, oh, you just want to record the answers? Sure. But to the user, they're thinking about, OK, I want to be able to understand everything that's done in audio and, and, and uh, react accordingly. How about another problem with these statements? What could go wrong with a requirement statement? What could be off about it? It could be the other, when the user is sending in the other direction. OK. That's right. That's right. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So there's often very different skill sets. It's not that the that the users are typically non-technical. They may know a heck of a lot about accounting or about chemistry or 
about epidemiology or what have you. And they'll make all sorts of assumptions about you what you know, and you're assuming that they understand something basic, like phones have limited battery life and you can't constantly run voice recognition you know, 24 hours a day and expect it to, uh, to, to you know, the battery to last. Um, or, or, you know, phones are not constantly connected to the cell phone network, and therefore you're not going to be able to look things up on Skyhook to figure out where people are uh, in real time based on, uh, based on their, their Wi-Fi connectivity or what have you. So, so there's a lot of assumptions there that are often off base. What else can go wrong, though, with requirements specifications? How could a requirement specification be, be problematic? Or, or uh, have, have a poor quality? If it does what to a requirement? If it misses it? Okay, if it's very ambiguous about it? If it misstates it? Right? Um, so it's a lot of different reasons. It can be incomplete, it can be ambiguous, it can be a conflict between two requirement statements. There's actually a contradiction. One's assuming constant connectivity. The other says that the system has to work well with only partial connectivity. If it's you know, out of range of the cell phone, um, it needs to still function perfectly. Very different origins. So sometimes you get requirements from different parties to the same organization. One, one person says this. The other stakeholder says that. And you get contradictions there. Uh, different priorities associated with them. Some are really high, uh, high important, highly important. Others are, are minorly so. Um, so it goes along with, with uh, stakeholder urgency. Another issue is origin with developers. What do I mean by that? Anyone? Oh, how could it be bad that this requirement originates with the developers? Yeah. Do you think that could happen? Yeah, that's right. And, and this is a lot of the issue. Sometimes developers have pet ideas. They want to do what's cool, right? Man, it would be cool to do that. Um, you know, you could, you could see it visualized in this way. And maybe to the stakeholder, that's really not important. That's not what they're seeking. Maybe it's even in conflict with what they're seeking. But the developers put these things in there. This happens actually quite a bit. Unfortunately, um, developers will slip something in in hopes that the client will like it. And often it comes from developers who have less voice in this process. They're, they don't get to meet with the client. And they want to pass on this pet idea. Um, and you know, project managers need a better way of managing it so that, so that these great ideas perhaps are brought to the table. But they shouldn't be slipped into requirements um, automatically. I say observational error and recall error. What do I mean by that here? Yeah, you're not remembering the discussion with the stakeholder properly. What did he say? Is there a recording of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, observational error would be something like, OK, the, the, the stakeholder says something, but you mishear it or misunderstand it, what is meant. And this is very common in different domains. If I get together with someone from Vito and they talk about STIs and I talk about STIs, will mean very different things. Um, and uh, observational error is actually quite common. I remember one early client I was working with commercially. It was maybe my, um, I don't know, my, my third or, or fourth deliverable commercially. And uh, we had this client uh, out in California. And uh, we had some technical documentation that used a, a technical term that's familiar from engineering and certain physical sciences. I think they probably use it in physics. We talk about the bias of a system. The, the system has a certain bias, meaning it has a certain offset associated with it. And um, the, develop, the, the client with which we were dealing was uh, someone in
okay, <laughs> you know, uh, you know um, it, it did not gather goodwill from the client. We, um, um, I remember one conversation, it may have been that one, where the project manager said, guys, we dodged a bullet with that one. Um, we, we, we managed to do it, and they became a great client, but, um, but it was a lot of trust building early on, and this was one of the pitfalls. So one party says something, the other party misunderstands it. can be very, very, very common. Um, t terms that seem colloquial to us are used in a very precise way on the other side. And similarly, the reverse. Um, and uh, moreover, though, a, a requirement statement can be unnecessarily specific. Why is that a problem? Don't we want requirements that are as specific as possible? You know, there should be a drop down, and and you pull. You know, the the users uh, the users should be able to select using that drop down the item that's appropriate for them. And there are two buttons: one to get it, indicate that, one to indicate this. Why is that a problem? That's right. That's, that's right. And so it may be that you discover things during the requirement that make this actually burdensome to implement. So that's one reason. But there's another reason, too. Often we want to port a system. And, and this is a really important lesson, so pay attention to this. Suppose we have a system written for Android, and we want to port it to iOS. Or suppose we have a system that is a desktop version, and we want to put it on a, a tablet or on a, a smartphone, so on portable devices. Um, you, you need some sense of what the requirements are to port the system. In other words, when you talk about porting a system, almost by implication, you're not talking about precisely replicating that system on the other other uh, system to the point of pixels. You're talking about taking the essential, uh, the essential operations of that system and moving it over such that it's compatible and, and, uh, and the user has a similar experience. But there's a lot of things that get adapted to the new system. And if you have requirements that are extremely specific, or if you, have, if you don't have requirements, you just say, well, the system is its own requirements. It gives you no guidance, really. OK, what can we change? What can we not change? Do you, do, you need these, do you need these widgets to look precisely like they do on Android when they're in the Mac, uh, when the, uh, they're over in the iOS side? Or can, they be, can we use sort of natural analogs over in iOS? These are important, important questions. And a requirements document is one of the biggest assets because it will articulate kind of what are the essential things that have to be done over on that other system. Okay, now I noted earlier in this class that a large fraction of the requirements we deal with are not specified by the user. These are not customer requirements. These are derived requirements. They're requirements that logically follow given the current state of technology, the, gur the current um, the skill sets of the people involved, the price point wanted by the customer, et cetera. So you have these sort of implied requirements. And a lot of them relate to kind of how, how we're going to do things. OK, so, so you know, uh, Dr. LSM says he wants the system to track TB contacts in the field um, on portable devices. Or he wants nurses to be able to record this information while they're out there in the field. OK, probably that means. He doesn't want to do it on paper, so probably that means doing some sort of portable system and probably a, a portable device. And to do that, you know, we probably need our system to operate with low power consumption, maybe run under Android or iOS, and to have a modest memory footprint. We can't store you know, the equivalent of an Oracle database on the system. So there's a derived requirements that kind of are implied by, but typically the user will not be aware of these. Does that make sense? User won't, won't see the logical connection, but we know to realize their vision, we need to do x, y, and z. So suppose I have a system with particle and CMC, and I want to run it um, really quickly to do certain types of analyses on the device or what have you. Um, I, need, I know I need to use GPUs. 
um, say, on, on a desktop machine in order to get the level of performance needed. And the libraries to use uh, GPUs, um, should be GPU libraries, are in C. So you've got to write it in C. Um, it would uh, be great if we could write it in Scala, but there's just not that support um, in place. So we need to put it in there, um, put it in a certain um, language. So, so there's a lot of requirements that are derived. And you need, to, um, you need to make note of those because they will end up impacting your system. Um, we often distinguish in the requirement side between functional requirements, requirements that dictate the behavior of the software, versus non-functional requirements. These are things that are not so much about behavior, the functions it offers per se, but about other aspects. What are some other aspects besides the functionality, besides the features in a colloquial sense of a system? Give me one. Performance. Another. Security. Others would be things like certain aspects of the, the usability or aesthetics of, of the system. So a functional requirement. Let's talk about what a functional requirement might look like. Um, so here's an example. And I have a bunch of them in following slides. A patron should be able to reorder any meal. No, pa a patron who shall be able to, should, the system should be able to make this possible, to reorder any meal, so the be, being able to reorder a meal here, um, that he had ordered in the previous six months, provided all food items in that order, here's a qualifier, are available on the menu for the meal date. Okay, so here, there's somebody, and typically we delineate user classes. So there's admin users, and then there's general users, for example. Um, and then maybe there's the system creators or what have you, um, developers of the system. And you know, they're able to do something, to something typically under some conditions. And uh, this sort of statement um, of this sort is very, very common within requirements. So here's another, another set of these. Some of them are from books. Um, I think I gave out this uh, book by Birkin on uh, software project management to uh, one of you, one of the um, project team leads here. Um, so, you know, a user indicates search and replace is needed. The software responds by prompting for a search term and replacement text. Notice it does not say there's a, you know, dialog box that comes up with these exact fields in it, but it's prompting them in some way. Emacs prompts in a very different way than get it or Kate or what have you, um, or Eclipse. But fundamentally, I'm prompted for search term and replace text. And they enter that and, uh, this, and essentially indicates using, and it doesn't say, using a checkbox maybe, maybe using a separate button. So offers to do a case sensitive uh, search to replace all occurrences. Um, so this is part of a use case here. Um, by which they may engage with the system, and it describes something about the functionality offered. Um, and here's another little little component of a use case. A user indicates the search term to the search engine, a response by displaying a list, list of pages uh, of pages that match their criteria. The list is limited to a certain number of results, and they may indicate these results to be displayed. In which case, the system displays those the next ones uh, instead. Um, you know, uh, all network transmitted data that includes health information shall be encrypted with 128-bit RSA encryption. By contrast, these are kind of use case statements. This is a statement of a requirement. Until the camera app is either closed by the user or experiences a timeout due to inactivity, the take button photo on the main IFP screen shall remain disabled. OK. Um, so here, we are describing the, the functionality of the system, how it behaves um, according to uh, some general patterns. Okay? The patron shall be able to reorder any meal. We, we saw that. Okay. Um, okay, so we've talked 
we, we've just seen elements of use cases. Did you folks encounter use cases in 370? OK. So you know, you have, uh, you have a patron of a restaurant, and you have the waiter, and you have the cook, and these are all, uh, these are all um, user classes within the system, and the waiter undertakes certain tasks, and the user plays certain roles, and, and they end up um, engaging with different features of a restaurant system, right? Um, and similarly for a restaurant ordering system like Skip the Dishes offers, right? With, with their websites. So here with the use case, we're telling a story. We focus on some user goal. Typically, it's delineated before the functional requirements really spec'd out. You describe stories, essentially, with users. How they come to the system, they use it, maybe to log in as administrator and go through a set of processes of, of viewing incidents that are recent and deleting those that are inappropriate and then logging out of the system. So there's typically many components of this, and it's designed to be understood by a broad set of people, including, including users or, or stakeholders of the system. Um, and it can be quite well, quite good for the cases where there's a lot of user interaction in the system. Um, and it can force you to kind of think about things like preconditions that, are, that, um, uh, that might otherwise go, um, go unobserved. The use cases, on the other hand, are not that great, not that helpful for delineating non-user facing functionality or working with uh, complex series of conditions, which are often represented better in a tree or, or a table, for example. On the non-functional requirement side, um, we have a variety of, of components. I mentioned performance. Uh, memory footprint is another one. Um, Aspect of platform limitations like limited battery life, and therefore it's uh, energy efficiency of your system, the reliability or availability of your system, its ability to be portable to different devices. A user might naturally think that, well, if you can put this system onto, you know, this device, you can put it onto my iPhone 6, and, and might not realize there's, you know, they're very different systems. So portability is often an example of a non-functional requirement. Um, uh, the robustness to errors, scalability under different user loads, again, often one that, that users are pretty are, find it hard to sort of um, remember up front, but can be very important to their expectations. They would like to roll this out to 1,000 people maybe now, but six months from now to 10,000. And all they tell you about is the thousand, but implicit is the larger hope. Yeah. Can you get a, a lot of these? You said some of these are hard to access for use cases. Yeah. Can you get a lot of them through um, another one of the diagrams we did in 370 was the user diagram? Yeah. Which is to look at all the different users and what components of the functionality in the right. system would be requiring. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's the case. That's right. If you if you thought to decompose it into sort of different user groups out there for something like portability, you might get that. Or you might have users, um, you know, who are accessing this with high bandwidth connections or lower bandwidth connections, something along those lines. Um, so I think that's uh, that's the case. Okay, so let's let's continue um, on. On here, okay. So, here's some tips on the requirement side, and we're going to go into some more of these um, in other slides. Uh, so, the one thing is, requirements documents um, are not documents you create one time and you leave. They're sort of living documents. They get updated over time as the user's needs um, evolve, and as understanding of those user needs get evolved. Um, and you know, an important principle for maintaining these documents is to link them up with other components that depend on them, many of which are listed over here. So elements of the design, the tests, the reviews, which may, which may relate specifically to certain requirements and to the code that depend on them. If you can trace them, in other words, if you can figure out which requirements go with which of these, why can that help you? Anyone? Why would that help you? If you know this requirement goes with this code, or with this part of the design, or this test. Yeah. 
the requirements change, or if the requirements are, cert, uh, are not realized, right? Like you may have certain ideas in mind for, for what you are achieving within this milestone. And so you're saying, okay, we have these, you know, these classes which are needed, these interfaces, these tests, these acceptance tests, as well as a sort of integration tests. And now, now you decide, look, from triage perspective, it's not safe for you to try to you know, get the system to record video on this particular, um, this particular iteration. Uh, we're going to leave that to later. What things can we now you know, um, avoid working on on the design side or the test side or the code side as a result? So you decide, OK, that's a bridge too far. We don't want to do that um, this, this round. What other, th other things can we leave out as a result? And by linking these up, you can get that, that understanding. Um, prioritization of requirements is really important. Um, being able to say, OK, which of these requirements is, you know, are more urgent or more central to success, uh, and which things are more kind of wish list. Um, authors will often suggest uh, structuring what are called acceptance tests, which are a particular type of system-wide testing that are designed to validate requirements, and specifically validate user requirements, requirements coming from the user. They're designed to sort of demonstrate that it matches this level of performance, or this level of security, or this, uh, this feature um, of, of being able to, to uh, access it in a certain way, use it in a certain fashion. Um, so uh, just trying to triage here so we have a bit of time for some further tips here. Um, so I mentioned just acceptance tests. Um, so if you have uh, very complex statements about when certain things need to be done, uh, suggestion is often break those up into to, um, uh, trees or to flowcharts or to tables to make clear sort of the, the different conditions under which different things have to happen rather than trying to place it out in longhand in, in, in full text. Um, and uh, goes without saying, try to avoid uh, ambiguous words or put parenthetical sort of explanations, what, explaining what is meant by a certain statement. Um, and so you might create multiple views of certain complex requirements just to make them clear, because they otherwise wouldn't be. So there's some things that you may not have realized um, uh, in terms of ambiguity, particularly cross-culturally, um, even within English. Uh, there's there's differences, um, and you know the the term um, for some large numbers like million and billion actually differ between different English jurisdictions, and uh, and uh, whether it means ten to the ninth or ten to the twelfth will differ uh, for different speakers. So you want to often by restating it in two forms you can delineate it. So here's this V diagram. I've alluded to it before. But often coding is tested at the unit level, detailed design at the integration level, higher level design at the system level, sort of more the architectural level, and then requirements undergo acceptance tests. In certain industries I've worked in, this, this area of acceptance tests is, is central to um, rolling out functionality for this industry. And there's very rigorous standards for validating software before they can be used um, legitimately within, say, a pharmaceutical company because of the levels of concern about medical, expo medical malpractice exposure. So you need to go through a level of acceptance testing that's extremely rigorous and that is clearly documented, has audit, audit trails associated with it to verify that you, you passed all these tests. Okay, let's talk about some some source of error. One thing is uh, ambiguity. Um, so the interviewer may have jumped to conclusions about what was meant, but didn't realize that they made an assumption about some unmentioned issue. They heard one thing, what was meant was another. Um, a missing requirement. This is a really important one. So th the danger here 
with missing requirements is that a requirement may not be mentioned for several reasons. And two, two reasons that are very different for why it might be mentioned is if users don't care about it. They don't want it. They're not interested in it. It's not part of their vision. Versus that they care about it so strongly they assume you know about it. Well, of course it has to be encrypted. You know, of course, if you're working with this sort of information, it needs to be encrypted. I mean, aren't you aware of the laws involving that? Um, and of course, the answer is no. You know, I don't. I, I'm not familiar with HIPAA. Um, uh, so, you know, here the, the requirement may not be mentioned in some cases because the user thinks it's obvious. It's it goes without saying, and as a result, they don't think to mention it explicitly. So missing requirements are one of these areas that, that is a risk, risk exposure. And you, know, you want to make sure that you can ask about certain areas to make sure things aren't being, aren't being mentioned but are being, being assumed here. Um, and we talked about observational and recall call error here. Um, OK. Um, right. So uh, just one thing to be aware of, um, requirements documents go through several stages. And um, uh, often you'll have, in, in a corporate context, often you'll have a series of documents that get more and more specific about what is being sought. They often will start with a product request, where sort of a big idea is given out, roughly what's wanted. And there may be marketing requirements documents that talk about broad features. And then there's a vision and scope document, which is getting um, more specific, but it's still at a very, very high level. I think I have an example of that uh, here. Yeah. So, so here would be, um, for example, a feature statement in a vision and scope document. Search results will be easy for most users to read quickly. So priority one, our goal will be to incrementally improve the usability of our search experience. We will redesign the current search result page to solve the top five customer complaints and the top five issues found in the upcoming usability study of the existing design. Um, the newly designed page will be the results page displayed from searches entered into all primary search entry boxes from the navigation bar, home page, shopping cart, if at ne negligible part from all search boxes. So this is, this is kind of a broad statement of what we're trying to achieve in terms of our vision and in terms of the priority associated with it. But you know, it ends up being turned into um, more specific uh, components. So this is the one I read earlier, where it's mentioning elements of a use case, you know, that it, respond, it, it responds to you by prompting for a search term and, and a replace term, et cetera. So this is a lot more specific than this vision document. So one thing you should realize is that these things will often go through these successive stages. And you know, these earlier ones are very, very rough. And vision and scope document is getting more specific. SRSs typically follow templates. Or a lot of them in industry will follow a template. In the consulting I've done in industry, the SRSs are often very formalized. And there's a number of public templates you can download which kind of systematically walk through different features of a uh, requirement specification, an SRS, that are, that are expected. So with you know, your system, a lot of them will fit rather nicely into SRS document templates. And if anyone are interested in, in seeing some of those templates, I could point you to some. But these basically delineate different areas. And even though your system might not need all components, it forces you to kind of think through the different elements of the system. So I'm not going to be really forcing this issue for this class and complex SRSs. But you should realize that in industry, often this, there's a lot of attention to that. Why would it be more important in industry than in this class? I mean, after all, in this class, isn't it also possible that you could you could um, fall prey to uh, the dangers of not having a good requirements document. What is it about work in industry that, that adds extra gravity to the need for these sort of things? Do the client exceed responsibilities? Sorry? Do the client exceed responsibilities? Well, OK. That's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, 
But uh, what else? You might have a confirmed contract and you have to get some into them. That's right. That's right. So there's a huge amount of money. So I've seen companies go under because of failure to really understand requirements well and to deliver on them in a timely fashion. And where there's a lot of money involved in risk of lawsuits, people tend to be quite particular about describing things. So that when the customer is going to sign that contract, they know very clearly what they're getting and they don't have any expectations that could lead them to sick their lawyers on you, telling, you, telling, um, telling others that you haven't delivered on your promises. So, so these things are often highly formalized. And uh, uh, that's, uh, there'll be no lawsuits, um, at least from certain stakeholders in this class. Um, yes? Orthopraxy is sort of paying, and you'll find this, it's paying attention to the to the sort of motions of, of going through this, um, putting together a document for the sake of, of having a document rather than for the sake of uh, it's sort of a ritual for putting together this document rather than for gaining, gaining benefit from it. It's like orthodoxy means standard thinking. Yeah. Orthopraxy means standard doing. Yeah, standard practice. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and that's, this actually covers a lot of things in this class. You know, I remember one team last year um, said uh, as part of their, I think it was their first presentation, within this class, we are going to document everything. Everything we do is going to be documented. And they evidently thought that that was really going to impress me. And I said, I'm totally uninterested in that. I'm not interested in you creating a document for the sake of documents to get, you know, tick off a checkbox um, associated with your project. I'm interested in you maintaining documentation to help your team succeed in delivering this, this product that you promised. And ladies and gentlemen, often that means going lighter on things which are well understood, you know, and, and broadly um, broadly un understood across the team and by the stakeholder, and really specking out those things which are ambiguous or uncertain, et cetera. And this is one of the dangers when you get into these documents of drowning in documents. I, I don't think probably any of us in the room love writing documents, right? Um, if so, we'd be over in arts, you know, the arts tower or something like that, right? Um, we're just not into to writing these things up for the sake of writing. Um, the point is, can you get value in terms of lowering risk, in terms of, um, of making sure that you're going to be able to be efficient as a team? And um, you folks learned about agile development within 370, right? Um, OK, a little bit? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. OK. Um, incremental development involving ongoing client contact, often in an embedded capacity where you're. OK. OK. Well, that's a, a step forward to learning it. Um, with agile processes, one of the reasons that they're attractive to people is because they, they focus a lot of their attention on the underlying drivers for success and not on the, the uh, sort of side effects or, or symptoms of success, if I could abuse a term there. What I mean by that is um, uh, they focus on things like morale and, um, and uh, quick adaptive response to client needs, um, getting the quality right, getting, getting the product in front of people uh, quickly to get, to get feedback. And one of the issues with traditional software development um, has been that, that by failing to put the attention on that area, you've had uh, software developers who are less um, engaged by their work. They're less engaged by what they're doing. And as a result, the morale is lower, and they tend to, tend to be more likely to leave. And what happens as a result? You get tons of documentation. 
because if people are going out the door in a revol or they're coming in and going out in a revolving door sort of way, in order to preserve institutional understanding, you need to put into documents because the people will be outlived by the documents. But in an agile process in a shop which puts attention to the quality side, to the morale side, um, you're hoping for a virtuous cycle where essentially you retain people, institutional knowledge gets captured in a lightweight way, and the documents are much lighter as a result. So their documents serve a function. There's a, goal, there's a use of documents to sort of make sure that people have a point of reference to remember something when they've forgotten it, or to learn about a feature of a system which you know, um, they can't even easily ask about. But the point of having a document is not to have a document in place for this. Um, so when I talk about orthopraxy there, I'm, I'm talking about just following certain rules in, in a rigid way. And I'm not interested in this class having orthopraxy about some particular ritual for, you know, documentation. I'm just not interested in that. I'm interested, can your team communicate effectively internally and, and with the stakeholder? And that requires some measure of documentation, but uh, it does not require volumes. And if you have volumes, probably it won't be read. And I'm not interested in giving a, a tick mark because you have 50 pages of software requirements spec. Instead, you should have enough to make sure that I'm good with it, and that I don't think I asked for this, and you think I didn't ask for it, and therefore we're at cross purposes. So you give what is needed under the conditions. And in this case, it's, it's not something heavyweight. Long answer to a short question. But uh, that's what I mean by orthopraxy, and that's the, the sort of uh, comment there. Um, OK, here's some more sort of vision vision statement documents. Registration page will make it easier to enter information without mistakes. Department information pages will, will be at least as fast as the home page itself. Database query interface will be as reliable as other parts of the system, et cetera. Um, these are sort of broad, broad goals. Um, this is useful for the client to, to understand, but it's not uh, specific. So if you are talking with a client, one of the foremost rules I suggest is this one. This is examinable, and I'd like you to remember it. Um, so at a requirements meeting, ask them to kind of restate what they're trying to achieve. And the folks who hear it should restate it after hearing it to make sure that they've understood it. In their own terms, explain it using their own language, and make sure the stakeholder agrees. Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, the point is that if you have observation bias, or if you have recall bias from another, from another previous meeting, you've forgotten something or you misinterpret it, when you restate it, when the team that's interviewing the client or that's, that's talking with the stakeholder, when they restate it, that may come out and the stakeholder will correct it. At the least, it can find differences in how a certain term is being used. And the stakeholder might say, well, wait a minute. When I use this term, I mean a very specific thing. And that will be made more clear. So restating things back at the time of the stakeholder discussion is a best practice. Take down some notes of what's required and say, OK, this is what I heard. Did I miss anything? Am I off base in describing any of these? That's really one of the most valuable things that, that you, can, you can do. Okay? Um, now, Weinberg, Jerry Weinberg has this thing about emphasizing different words in the problem statement to really be, be quite specific about, um, about uh, the most important things. And that's, I have many books are on effective requirement solicitation. Some of the best are by Weinberg. Um, and by Uyghurs and by, um, by Robertson. And if anyone's interested, I'm glad to show them. This is not a big component of this course, but I would want you to be sure that when it comes to your stakeholder, you want it to be clear about that what you've agreed to and what they've agreed to align. What they think they've agreed to, what you think you've agreed to align. 
Okay? So, any questions related to requirements? Silence. Do you think you could do without a requirements document altogether? That's right. That's right. I mean, look, again, it's not a matter of perfection, just like testing is not a matter of perfection. Perfection is outside of our grasp in both these areas. But if you could have one page that I think this is what is being agreed to, that's just vastly better than none in the sense that it really lowers exposures. Going to 10 pages, well, it helps some. It'll, it'll help flesh things out a bit. Going to 100 pages, how much incremental benefit do you think you get? Going to 100 pages, not much. If it's a requirements document for Microsoft Windows 7, then... OK, yeah. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a, a large-scale system, or if it's a system with a great deal of gravity associated with it, like millions of dollars associated with it, or if it's a system... Something not that would use the space. That's right. A system that, that uh, is a lot less... Um, there's a lot less opportunity to kind of uh, you know, get something small in front of them, get feedback, et cetera. These things are worth it. But remember, one of the hallmarks of the Agile method is um, that you're not promising the entire system up front. You're promising bits of functionality.